Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members and guests. Welcome to our annual Founders Day program here in Akron, Ohio, the birthplace of Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help other, others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. It does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. Our anonymity, like our sobriety, sobriety is a treasured possession. We ask the help of our guests, especially those of the press and the radio, in protecting the anonymity of all alcoholics present or mentioned here this evening. We sincerely hope that you may hear something tonight that you may take away with you and use. However, we respectfully request that you leave the names of those on the platform and in the audience here where they belong in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I thank you. I feel at this time I should introduce myself. My name is Sid S., and I am an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Our beloved member, the late Howard B., if he were here right now, would say, Isn't it wonderful to be sober? There's no one could say it like Howard, though. How hard you try. The person that I am about to introduce, I am sure many of you know, love, and respect. He was closely associated with Sister Ignatius in the early days of our fellowship and has continued on in the relationship to the present day. When asked to be our guest this evening, he graciously consented and will open this meeting with the invocation. Monsignor Trivasano. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty, merciful God, we ask your blessing this evening, a special blessing on the co-founder of this movement here present, a blessing upon all those here present from near and far, a special blessing upon their efforts, their intentions, their hope. A special blessing upon the work that they are doing to further the brotherhood of man and woman under the fatherhood of God. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation the deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our next guest is a representative of the city of Akron, pitch hitting for the Honorable Mayor Erickson tonight, and will give you a word of welcome. Mr. Larry Kish, the service director. Mr. Chairman, guests on the platform, ladies and gentlemen, and especially those from out of town, uh, I bring a word of official greeting from Mayor Erickson. The mayor regrets that he could not be here this evening, although he did attend a dinner at uh, the Sheraton Hotel and spoke a greeting to the dinner guests assembled there. Of the many distinctions that the city of Akron is proud of, I think the proudest that we are, we are here in the city of Akron are that 
we are the cradle of the birth of the AA organization, an organization dedicated to helping human mankind, human beings. Uh, no one, I'm sure, can measure the worth of an organization such as this that deals in helping a fellow man. Certainly that is the noblest work that is can be performed by uh, the human race. And the mayor especially wants to greet the people or to communicate to the people from out of town that as you come back to the city that was uh, gave the birth to AA, that he hopes you enjoy our hospitality, and as you go about our town, you may see it in a state of disassembling, disassemblage, because we are in a process of, in we are in four urban renewal programs, and if, probably when you come back the next time, you will not recognize our city. In fact, I met some of the people from Chicago and other points that asked me to say here tonight that of all the cities that they had ever attended, that Akron was the most hospitable. And I shall convey that message also to the mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. Akron, Ohio is a mecca for all members of AA who gather here each year to honor the founders of our fellowship. The living and the dead. Our beloved co-founder, Dr. Bob, passed away November the 19th, 1950. A living memory, a true example to you and I. In Bill's own words on our 25th anniversary, he said, I quote, Certainly no AA anniversary would be complete without our affectionate and universal recollection of co-founder Dr. Bob. What he is to us and what he did for us all, end quote. This 30th anniversary would not have been complete without the presence of our other co-founder. We are indeed grateful also for what he is to us and what he did for us all. I'd like to introduce now a man that really shouldn't need no introduction, and our beloved co-founder, Bill W. friends. Just before coming over here, a number of us, I guess a couple of hundred, had dinner together down at the hotel. And as I walked into the dining room, an old time friend came up and he said, Bill, it's good to see you back home. I think he had no idea of how much that moved me, of what recollections it stirred. In its fourth year, four years after Dr. Bob and I met, the A book came out, and the last chapter of the text, you remember, is titled, A Vision for You. At that time, we boasted 100 members, and I think maybe it was a boast. We were virtually unknown, and yet in this book, the vision for you, while none at that time could say that he was a prophet, 
we did express some hopes. And in leafing through that chapter this afternoon, I read you one, and with this content I would like you to contrast AA today with the hope expressed here. This short paragraph says, Someday, we hope that every alcoholic who journeys will find a fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous at his destination. To some extent, this is already true. Some of us are salesmen, and we go about. Little clusters of twos and threes and fives of us have sprung up in other communities. And those who travel drop in as often as we can. This practice enables us to lend a hand. At the same time, avoiding certain alluring distractions of the road about which any traveling man can inform you. That was written four years after the beginning, here at home, our spiritual home. Well, it's come true. And it comes truer with every passing year. Sometimes we don't like cliches, but there's one that's most appropriate nowadays. The sun never sets upon the society of Alcoholics Anonymous. We are 350,000 strong, maybe 500,000, nobody knows. We speak many languages. We are of all races, creeds, religion, bound together in this kinship of a common suffering and a common recovery under the grace of a bounteous God. So we here tonight are returned home to think again about the days of our beginning. Lois and I never fail to come here, and I must observe that it was with great disappointment she couldn't come, a sudden but not serious illness. But of course we never come here without asking that we be driven up to see the house of Dr. Bob and Ann on Ardmore. And thence down Portage Path to see the gatehouse where Henrietta Cyberling brought us together. And thence down to the house of T. Henry Williams, where he and Clarissa, in the old Oxford group time, took us in. And to King's School, AA's number one group. We do this because the experience of returning home is something that every human being treasures. And all the greater, because so many have gone out from this home, and there have been started little clusters of two and three. 
I would like to leave with you a word picture of such a cluster that not long since, a brief five years ago, started in a foreign country. An AA called Ryan went down there. He spoke Spanish. He started an insurance business. The alcoholism was very bad in this little country the size of a postage stamp. And people flocked in as they had never before to AA because the need was so awful. The drug stores sold grain alcohol, a bad and toxic kind of stuff. No tax. It was cheaper, literally, to drink than to eat. So they flocked around in twos and threes and fives, and that was only five years ago. And as maybe Alan, who will speak at breakfast tomorrow, will tell you he's been down there. This is suddenly expanded into thousands of members. Some say 10,000, some five. What does it matter? And this is the succession. And these are the kind of fruits that it has borne to others throughout the world. So let me address myself just for a couple of minutes to the memory of Dr. Bob and Ann and Henrietta and T. Henry and Bill D. A. number three. You remember I arrived in this town on a, vid on a business venture. It was a proxy row for control of what was then a little company in this town. The fight fell through. My associates were of the come lately variety. All my old friends in Wall Street were gone. So they also went. I was left in the Mayflower Hotel with ten bucks in my pocket. Prior to this, I had worked very hard back home with drunks, uh, you know, Oxford group people uh, had a mission. We worked there, worked at Towns Hospital where my doctor was. Absolutely no result. And looking back, I see that I was still preaching to people. But all of a sudden in the lobby of the hotel down there, I had my first temptation to drink since sobering up. And it suddenly dawned upon me that I might, while I was, had been granted by God a rebirth, it had been the effort to help others that had kept me sober. So I suddenly knew that if I were to stay sober, I needed to find another alcoholic in this town. So I looked down the church directory. There was a name, Walter Tunks, who turned out to be the Episcopal rector here. It was a little odd sounding and uh, whimsically I picked it out. Providentially, I think, too. And this good man directed me to another, a member of the Oxford groups here at the time, and he in turn gave me a list of about ten names. And uh, 
I began to call them up. Well, it was a weekend. I couldn't make any immediate dates for that day. Somebody I had to see right then. At the end of the list was the name Henrietta Simberlin. And I thought, well, gracious, I, I met the old gentleman one time, and I can't possibly go out to this lady's home telling her I'm looking for a drunk to work on. This will never do. I walked up and down that lobby again, and a voice came saying, you had better make that call. I went upstairs and made the call, and here was Henrietta's delightful southern voice on the wire. And she said, I'm no drinker, but I think I understand. Won't you come straight out here? How much we owe our friend. And to a stranger, she said this. So out I went. Said she, I think I know just the man. It's Dr. Bob. He and his wife, Anne, are in a terrible situation. He's desperately trying to get over his drink. I'll call them up. She did. Anne's voice came on the wire. Said, Anne, it's the day before Mother's Day, you know, Henrietta. And Dr. Bob has just come home. He has brought with him a potted plant. It's on the table, but he's on the floor, and I'm afraid he can't get up, so we won't be there today. So nothing daunted, Henrietta said, well, so what about tomorrow? Now she said, Bill, you come out here to dinner, and let's see. So on tomorrow, at five in the afternoon, Dr. Bob... And Anne stood in the door. And he did not look in the least like a founder. He was shaking like hell. <laughs> and he said, eyeing me, uh, he said, you know, I can only stay a few minutes. I have an appointment. So by way of identification, I thought, well, I know, Bob, uh, <laughs> no question, you're very thirsty, am I right? He was. Discreetly, Henrietta moved us into the little library. And we sat there and talked for hours. And right there, the whole character of what I had been doing back home changed. I thought to myself, I need this man as much as he needs me. And I so told him. Well, Dr. Bob, in spiritual matters, was far advanced on me. But as far as the drinking was concerned, it hadn't taken hold. Yet, as a doctor, like so many, he had no idea that he was a sick man. And I acquainted him with that. Anne asked me to come over to the house and stay with them while I tried to carry on with this proxy jingle. Bob made one trip to Atlantic City, and it was hard for Ann to let him go, and sure enough, he came home boiled. There was a terrible dilemma. He had to sober up. Uh, uh, he had to do a critical operation within two days or three. So around the clock, Annie and I tapered him down. And we took him shivering up to the city hospital, handed him one bottle of beer and one goofball, and he went in to carve up this patient. Well, you can imagine how we felt as we sat outside in the car. After a while, he came out. He said, I'm going to take you folks home. I have some errands to do. Hours later, after a lot of worry on our part, he turned up. He had already started to make restitution to those he had harmed. And he never took a drink from that day on. And then he said, but working on other people is a big thing, isn't it? I'll call up the city hospital. Maybe they got some cases. 
He'd been on the staff, but I believe he'd been kicked off. He called up a nurse he knew. He said, there's a gent here from New York that uh, has been helping me, and uh, we'd like some drunks to work on. And the nurse said uh, with some asperity, well, Dr. Bob, I hope you bought this idea yourself. He said, we've got a butte. She did. Just came in here. He's in DT. He's strapped down. But before we got him strapped, he blacked the eyes of one of the nurses. He's been in here four times in the last six months. How's that? Bob said, that's a dandy. Here's the way to medicate him. We'll be down tomorrow. On the morrow, there was the man on the bed. We walked in, we told him the story, and he said, well, it's too late for me. But he says, won't you come back again? Yes, Bill, we'll come back again, we said. Next morning we came down. There was his wife, Henrietta, standing by the bed. Bill looked at us. Henrietta said, these are the fellows that understand. Now listen to what they have to say. So we went over it again. And Bill said, Henrietta, please fetch me my clothes. We're going home now. Bill never took another drink. And so God had wrought the first AA group in the world. And the magnificent sequel to this in this town, you know. Bob's association with Sister Ignatia. She and he ministering to 5,000 cases in the ensuing 10 years from 1940 at St. Thomas. After his death, she ministering to another 10,000 cases. Indeed, I think it's altogether saying, proper to say, that these two were the prince and the princesses of twelve steps, and never will there be any more like them. I'm taking too much time. God bless you, and I'll call it synonymous forever. I'm glad we're here at home together. You know, I was thinking this morning that 30 years ago there was a man staying in this hotel who had a problem. He had a decision to make, whether to go get drunk or find a drunk that he could work with and stay sober. Well, he made that decision to find the drunk, which he did, and you know that that change, that decision changed the lives of everyone in this room and thousands of people all over the world. I want to give you our co-founder, Bill W. Bill, you saw it too, right? He kind of took me by surprise. I didn't think my turn was around yet. These magnificent hours that we have been spending together will for each of us, of a certainty, be a treasure trove for memories in future time. 
the unforgettable experience. It is our 30th anniversary year, and this well-loved society of ours is standing upon the threshold of its fourth decade. The old-timers are going out into the sunset, and soon there will be no more who can remember the very early time here. We have been gathered here, first of all, in gratitude and then to joyfully reminisce on how it all began. And for us, a very old time, it's something pretty special. There can't be too many more of these times. I say this in no maudlin spirit, and I want to add that I think all of us in this dwindling group are now utterly confident of the destiny of AA and the part that it will play in the world of tomorrow. Our family has grown, not grown up, but it has come of age. I think that the fears of yesterday are laid to the side by the spectacle of all that God has wrought among us. So faith has supplanted fear. We have been taking an inventory of ourselves in all of these meetings, and on the whole it has been a very positive inventory. We have had our best foot, or rather our best feet, forward. But I'm sure that we don't really mean to overlook the fact that AA is a fellowship which has been created on a base of awful pain and instability for us. Almost more than any other society, pain has been the touchstone of our spiritual progress. So we can say, thank God that we have suffered such pain, that such a spectacle as this has been brought into view and being. Now then, as a graphic illustration of how pain and fear and all of our worst motives can eventuate under God's grace for the best, I would like to, in a hop, skip, and jump fashion, tell you about the preparation of the AA book this was our great venture in change, the first one. There have been several since. And believe me, we approach this with great trepidation. By 1938, I think here in New York 
and with a few from Cleveland, we may have been 40 members. Our average sobriety time, a couple of years. And yet, we felt that we ought to have something on paper that could be fed out on a transmission belt to the drunks in the world about us. We had to have, we thought, a book. But the very prospect of such a thing just simply flabbergasted. Who would publish such a book? Who could assemble such a book? What should go in it? Supposing it turned out badly. These, indeed, for us, were great and most natural fears. And then a plan came into being... It was thought there ought to be a text. It was thought these ought to be backed up by stories. And this text was, in the first edition, two-thirds of the stories came from Akron. You were the largest and oldest aggregate. But then, still more clouds cluttered up the horizon. Some of us in New York considered the possibility of publishing this book ourselves, of raising the money, first of all through uh, perhaps contributors to our newly born foundation down there in New York. But there were no contributors. So then it was thought that the book ought to be taken to a publisher. But a few of us stood for the proposition, well, this would be bad because control of our literature would be in other hands. And some of us, in a more self-serving way, and this definitely included me, we felt that the book might make some profits and some royalties out of which its creators could eat. (laughs) Well, when this motivation began to be suspected and became apparent, a quite a violent opposition rose up. Maybe the damn book wouldn't be any good. It might turn into a racket. It could absolutely ruin us. However, since there was no dough inside any place, we then conceived the most absurd proposition that though no book had been prepared, well, I had my own story written out, that if we took this story in hand and then went down to a stationery store and bought a pad of stock certificates, and wrote on them, Works Publishing Company. The title was chosen because there would be a lot more work, you know, after this. Power Value 25. So down east, we began to peddle stock in what turned out to be the AA book, but we were peddling stock to drunks, $25 a share. The purpose was what? To feed... Wilson and the gal who helped do the book and the promoter and the collector of the money while this job was being done. In other words, people were asked to buy stock in a book that hadn't yet been written. I think this is a world's record for sheer audacity, absurdity. (laughs) Well, not strangely, our fellow alcoholics uh, demurred. So, uh, what would we do? Well, I wrote another sample chapter and tried that on them. No stock purchases. So then we went up to the Reader's Digest and told them about our budding movement 
And I guess we brandished Mr. Rockefeller's name pretty liberally, you know, as a close friend. He wasn't giving us any money, but he liked us. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the digest said, well, fine. When will your book come out? By now, it's the fall of 38. Oh, we said about next spring. They said, this is just the kind of story uh, that we'd like. We will do a piece. We'll put a feature writer on this. So then, with that much in hand, we came back with those stock certificates, and this time we made up a prospectus. And in the prospectus, it pointed out that you could actually print up 5,000 of these books. We were then 40 members. And that this could be done for 35 cents a piece. And that even under the commercial price, which a publisher would charge, we would sell these 35 cent books for the sum of 350. We didn't indicate any other expenses, but that seemed quite a margin of profit to the prospective stock buyer. And we pointed out that they couldn't possibly miss. Because, after all, the digest piece with millions of circulation, in which they definitely would mention the new book, would simply move these volumes out in carloads. So in the prospectus, we totted up what the profits would be. Oh, I think we started in with something like a 100,000 books, and uh, you know, the first few carloads, and uh, I think we got as high as a million copies. Well, of course, if they only cost 35 cents and you sold them for 350, it was would be, frankly, a great rise in that $25 stock. Might go to a thousand bucks a share. We didn't put all this on paper, but it was a part of the promotion. Well, this was heard out in this country, uh, that this ex-Wall Street swindler uh, <laughs> was contriving one of the greatest rackets known to the mind man. And uh, the trustees were very dubious. Uh, they had no money at the time, so we were able to face them down and say, well, we'll separately incorporate this. And sure enough, by an appeal to the loyalty of the stockholders to the cause, but also by an appeal to the pocketbook, the baser nature, the money began to dribble in, $25 per bed. So then we had only begun our troubles. Then the book had to be written. <laughs> However, we were eating a few of us on the stockholders' money. And little by little, the chapters were evolved. And we thrashed them around in the AA meetings, and we carefully checked them with Dr. Bob as they went along. And meanwhile, he, at great pains and difficulty, got stories largely from this town as case histories to back up whatever it was going to say in the text. Nobody knew yet. Well, the hassles, the unholy hassles, if you please, that went into the formation of what some are pleased to call a more or less holy book were absolutely beyond belief. In short, here was AA at its worst, but under God's grace, coming up with something better. Maybe history will say the best. And so the work went on, and I remember one night, we got through the first four chapters, which were window dressing, and I was having an imaginary ulcer attack, and it looked like, um, uh, well, things were very gloomy. The stockholders were kind of, uh, you know, falling down. The, 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 the meal ticket was getting in danger, and I was very resentful. And I realized, lying in bed, 
there in Brooklyn, Clinton Street, that the book had to say what it was all about at some place. So I began to write, and out came the 12 steps. Well, when they appeared, there was a terrific uproar. And as a result of the uproar, again, the constructive came out. I had had a great spiritual experience, so that I had used God all the way through those 12 steps. Our atheist and agnostic contingent said, drunks only going to buy that. They're scared to death of being God-bitten. This ought to be a psychological book. On the other hand, uh, the religious people uh, said that it should be a strictly Christian book, theologically speaking. So one had to sort of average these point of view. So, but the contribution of that God as you understand him did open the door wide. And yet it was made in a time of awful stress and strain when the motivation wasn't so high. Sure, we must have had God's help. We never could have produced it ourselves. Well, finally the great day, a publication approached. We had pre-publication copies of the book made, circulated around for criticism. And with the last of our money, almost the last, we persuaded the printer that this was such a terrific venture uh, that uh, he certainly ought to accept a 10% down payment for 5,000 books, which were going out with the carload, this first installment. So we paid him $500 for 5,000 books. Then we went up to the digest and said, now what about this piece? Uh, we're all ready to shoot. And the editor to whom we had talked vaguely remembered us, and he said, shoot what? <laughs> Why, you were going to print this piece about this new society, and it's now it's going to be called Alcoholics Anonymous. We'd been calling ourselves out there a nameless bunch of drunks, and from that the anonymity idea had come in. In fact, the, the book title, as voted by Akron, New York, and the few Clevelanders, was chosen as the way out. But in the Library of Congress, we'd found that there were 12 books by the name of the way out, so for heaven's sake, we couldn't make a 13th, so it became Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, we reminded uh, our friend that a piece was due, and he said, gee, Mr. Wilson, he said, we, you know, after you were here, uh, I went to the rest of the staff here, very sure that this would be a great piece, uh, but they didn't think so, and I forgot to tell you. So we had 5,000 books in the warehouse. There were 100 AA members. There were about 30 stockholders, and they each got a book. There were, there, <laughs> there were about 30 guys who put stories in the books, and they each got a book, and that was 60 books. So we only had 40 books to sell the rest if they'd buy it. Well, at that time, things folded up in a big way. And, uh, we were about to be evicted from our house in Clinton Street. Stuff go into storage. The book was bankrupt, and we made one last great gasp effort. A drunk came along by the name of Morgan, who had been in the ad business, and he said, you know, I know Gabriel Heater. You know, the guy who puts on those wonderful sob talks. And he said, I think Gabriel would put this on the air. So we scared up a few dollars more. And to get ready for Gabriel, we decided. <laughs> we wondered what we ought to do in the way of preliminary advertising. Well, we picked out a hard class of people to advertise to in those days. We picked out all of the physicians east of the Mississippi, Mississippi River, all of them. And to each one, we sent a postal card, which said, 
listen to Gabriel Heater as he talks about the new society of Alcoholics Anonymous. And buy the book Alcoholics Anonymous, A Cure for Alcoholism. <laughs> well, one great trouble with Ryan was that he wouldn't sober up and he was supposed to be interviewed on the air. <laughs> <laughs> My God, our last cent was in this thing and all these puzzle cards. So just as a precaution, one of our friends who was a member of the Down Athletic Club said, Well, now, uh, you, you can have my room over there. I don't use it much. And Why doesn't somebody live with Morgan in there the week before, you know, to just stay with him? And be sure he gets the heater all right. So the great day came. The postal card was out in Akron, New York, Cleveland. The ears were to the radio. We visioned the books going out in carloads, orders flooding in. Biggest profit of all in direct mail, no commission. And sure enough, heater pulled out the tremolo stop. Ryan was sober, and boy, we were made. Well, we gave a post office box, old 458 in New York, I think it was, where we had a one-room office. Little Ruthie Hawk, who helped me with the book, bless her soul, my promoter friend Hank Parkhurst and I just couldn't wait to get over to see what was coming into that box. We stuck it out for four days, and this took real restraint, because there would be a fortune over there. And finally we went and looked in the box, and you could see a few of these cards. I had a terrible sinking sensation. But Hank was an incorrigible optimist. He said, well... He could, they couldn't put them all in the box. He said they got several mailbags full out there. <laughs> so, the clerk came with the cards. Hank said, ain't there any more? No. We took them over to the desk and we counted them. And there were twelve. And ten of them were from doctors, obviously stewed themselves, <laughs> who lambasted the hell out of us, and we had exactly two orders for the book Alcoholics Anonymous. So this is the unholy way in which God nevertheless graced us in the days when A.A. was very young. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.